Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. It gives me great pleasure to welcome one of the greatest mediators around, John Biancardi, to its rainmaking time. Mr. Biancardi has had a mediation business for over 15 years. He develops and instructs courses on the subjects of mediation and divorce. He teaches at the UCLA Extension he has for the last 15 years. He's one of the only people in the country that have seven copyrights to his methods and processes for mediation. He does 10-hour mediation sessions to settle divorces for less than $5,000. There's almost nobody doing what he's doing or even understands how to do what he does. He's humble. He's clear. He's got tremendous integrity. And he's on to something about what we really should be doing when we're in this level of a conflict with our spouse. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome John Biancardi to It's Rainmaking Time. Good morning. Good morning, Kim. It's good to talk to you again. Thank you very much for that gracious opening. I'm, I'm flattered. Thank you so much. And I appreciate this opportunity for speaking with you. When I met you several years ago, I think it was 2004, you had shared with me that you mediate 10-hour divorces. And I want to know, are you still doing that? And how are you able to do that? Sure. It's an outstanding question. Some people are skeptical, so let me address that. I have that, as you mentioned, a copyrighted methodology for mediation. So in broad sense, it's not just two or three people in there shooting the breeze. There's a definite method to what I do. It's very lineal. It's never rushed. You're never hurried. But it moves along in a straight line with me shepherding people along the way. So actually right now, my statistical average since that time is the more you do things, the better you get it, is actually eight hours. I average two four-hour sessions for divorce. And the reason is, since I'm there as that third party, it cuts out all the bickering that couples love to do. So I'm able to control or continue bickering, focus on what's really important, and then move towards solution. When you do that, you're focused and you have the skill sets of a mediator, how to manage emotions, how to actively listen. It, you can effectively negotiate any divorce in about eight hours. So it's proven true even statistically to this day. See, here's the tragedy. There's a lot of people that have come as far as they can go in their marriage. And they've either grown apart or one has grown further than the other or they have different interests at that time in life. And it's no longer what it was after all these years. And the divorce doesn't have to be cantankerous. It doesn't have to be horrible and nasty. Hundreds and thousands of dollars don't have to be bled from a person's family. And so there's a lot of times that it's appropriate to then initiate a divorce. And even with people that are very mature and very clear and very together, they're processing pain, they're processing loss, they're processing not doing the day-to-day -day with this other person, even though they may have moved on emotionally. And the problem is that when they go to a traditional attorney, the attorneys bring in something that's very different than a mediator. The whole consciousness of a lawyer or an attorney is totally different than a mediator. But most people don't believe a mediator at $400 an hour, many of them charge, can solve anything, and that can still be expensive too. Yes, and between those two choices, litigation and mediation, which are your only two choices, well, actually, there's a third choice. People can actually self-divorce if they're willing to go through all that process. But what mediation does, and to reflect on the essence of what you just asked me, I, I always tell folks, I had to learn that people can fall out of love. But all the couples I've done, they all swear to me that in the beginning they were in love, and I have to believe them. And so I just tell people, apparently you can fall out of love. But whether it's just I, we mutually fell out of love or it's hotly contested because something bad happened in the marriage, uh, mediation is still the way to go because we don't, as you were implying, mediators do not play on people's fears or frustrations or anger. We dissipate those emotions. We avoid the litigation games, and people can kind of cut to the chase. So part of my efficacy is not only the methodology, but any mediator worth his or her salt in a divorce situation with his emotionality contains that um, we're, not on a, uh, we're not an ATM machine for folks, which is why I did the flat fee, and we can address that a little later. But as you're billing out, uh, when you de-escalate the hostilities, the uh, length of the um, argument is dramatically reduced. So 
So mediation's efficacy is not just we manage emotions. There's no legal strategies involved. It's straight to the cut to the chase. And people realize they're in control of their own situation. Their emotionalities can be all over the map, but I always apologize to them that if the only thing, and here's what I say to them, the only thing I can't fix in a divorce is a broken heart. And it's true. It's the only thing I can't fix in a divorce is a broken heart. So if one of them has that, I can address that. Or if they're just both so angry that they can't even be in each other's presence, mediation also addresses that without buying into that game that can fuel a lawsuit. The thing is that we have a litigious paradigm that surrounds married couples and people that are together so that when it's appropriate to separate and to reconstruct their lives, that next part of the process is surrounded by a culture of friends, associates, and acquaintances that often will superimpose their unfinished business with stuff onto the people that are separating fueling legal action. And so that's the gravity of what's happening. By the time you come in, they're all being told by their friends, associates, and acquaintances, and anybody that they'll talk to, to go to a lawyer. And I can see that you uh, have done some homework and you've been uh, aware of the situation. You're exactly right. Um, When people come to me, I'll tell them, particularly at the first session, I used to have two sessions, I'll tell them, you're getting advice. I already know you're getting advice from everybody. I, I tell them, do your homework. I want them to come in prepared, no doubt. But do not listen to friends and family if they're not in the field or the profession. I said, they mean well, but who knows what their personal agenda is towards you or the other person. So I tell them, unless it's a professional, don't listen. Because most people, God bless them, give advice, but that's bad advice. Because there are so many myths, if you will, surrounding divorce. Well, you know, California is a community property, no-fault state, which is why mediation works perfectly for it. It's going to end up where it ends up anyway. The only time you have to fight in a divorce is if someone was purposely hiding something. Well, now they're perpetrating a fraud, so of course it gets more complicated. But in your everyday divorce where people are just dissolving not only their relationship ties but their financial and debt ties, uh, that can easily be done in a negotiation process in a community property, no-fault state. But to, to go back to your uh, original point, I'm not saying attorneys buy into that uh, and, and cause the issue. The system, our legal system causes that. When people go excessively off, they're listening to the battle voices rather than the diplomatic voices. And that's what media is, is bring a diplomatic voice to this situation because it's going to settle. Uh, it, everything you just described is what happens in a divorce, sometimes times 10. It's bad. Uh, but uh, when you dissipate those hostilities, which is much of what the media is doing in the beginning, uh, giving people that forum to say in a confidential, safe environment, that you can release much of the negative energy so they can now reason with each other again. How are you able to do this without being a therapist? Seriously. Yeah. Well, and on, on one hand, for full disclosure, I used to be a therapist. That's part of my background. I'm kind of culmination, if you will, of a, a mediator. I used to be a therapist. So now, you don't have to be a therapist, but what you must be, and I, and I think this is something that's true for everybody these days, you need emotional intelligence. You've heard of the trainings you can receive in emotional intelligence. It's what many people are lacking these days. So I, I think with uh, emotional intelligence, uh, a mediator uses that skill and gift in when people who are in situations where really their reasoning and judgment is impaired because they're so uh, either fearful or upset. I think also a lot of people have the perception that mediation is not as powerful and not as solid as litigation. And I appreciate that question as well, because it is a common misconception. Uh, People will think it's uh, virtually impotent, if you will. Well, any agreement reached in mediation that's uh, like a divorce is is binding. And in fact, you have the exact same protections, the exact same legal rights, the exact same recourse and mediation as you do anywhere. I'll go further. There's actually more remedies at law in mediation than there are in litigation. Let's say you went to uh, court for your divorce and there was an issue you couldn't resolve, your visitation, house, or money. The judge is going to decide that, but he or she is limited. It's either continue doing what you're doing or stop doing or pay or don't pay. The court has very limited black and white choices, whereas in mediation, the world is actually gray. And couples discover that any remedy that can be devised 
will be accepted by the court because it's mutually agreed upon. So there's actually more remedies at law in mediation that can be very creative uh, than litigation can actually uh, afford itself to address. Now, if you're in a litigation and you negotiate your settlement, well, more power to you. Uh, but in, in that situation, it's designed to be adversarial, where in mediation, it's designed to be non-adversarial. Have you ever had one or two of the parties end up hating you during the process? That's a fair question. I wouldn't say uh, hate, not that I'm mincing words, but you're parsing words. I would say that they will, uh, let's say this, they're going to transpose their views on me. It's it's called transference in counseling. I think they're transferring, if it's ever happened to me, and it probably has, they've transferred their hate and hostility onto me as the object of their anger rather than where it belongs. And the people who tend to do that are the ones who don't take any responsibility for themselves whatsoever in the situation. So they're always playing the blame game anyway. So I, I, this probably happened to me where there's been transference, where I'm the object, plus I'm an easy object. Remember, um, mediators of the many definitions were actually whipping posts for people. I, I actually welcome and invite that. I'd rather have them do that to me than each other. But almost certainly it's happened where they've transferred their hostilities towards me, and I just kind of dissipated it. I didn't take it personal. Have you ever had to fire a client? I've never had to fire a client. In fact, when I teach people, a mediator should never, never throw in the towel in the negotiation. Our job is to exhaust diplomacy even as they're walking out the door. That's our job. So I've never had to throw in the towel. The closest I've come to that, though, it's actually more intuitive than you might imagine, is there are some folks who cannot represent themselves. In a mediation, when I say represent, I don't mean have legal ideas. Not the mediator provides you with the professional services. I mean who can speak uh, coherently, put two sentences together, defend themselves, have a backbone, just enough so where I'm not doing all their work for them as the mediator, so it looks like I'm defending them. So I have done in the past, not where I've thrown in the towel, but I have strongly suggested that he or she needs representation during this mediation. And it works just as well. When you say representation, what does that mean? That, that's, again, intuitive. Why, what I mostly mean with folks is third-party professionals like an attorney. Okay. However, if the other party agrees, and which is one of the many attractive attributes of mediation is, first, no one gets in that room except someone to, who's uh, a part of the dispute, unless the parties agree. So let's say someone wanted uh, a, a counsel by them at their elbow, a rep at their elbow, someone they can rely on, and the person across that table says, fine by me, because they're covered by confidentiality anyway. I have had occasions where it has been a friend or a relative for, you know, that uh, not only intellectual uh, firepower, but the emotional support, just so the mediation can happen. And if you're wondering why the other person would ever allow that, because it looks like it's two against one, one, that's my job to regulate those discussions. But secondly, without that, the mediation might never happen. So in all likelihood in that situation, which has come up for me, that what I persuaded them is, if you let that person in, mediation will occur. If you don't, this person's going to court, either out of fear or anger. Wow. Now, is the person that's brought in also bound by confidentiality? That's exactly true. And in fact, unknown to most of the public, because mediation is fairly unknown, is that all mediation, anything that comes under the auspice of mediation service, is automatically protected by confidentiality in California. Uh, but it's so important to me that when people come in, some of the pre-paperwork I send besides my client contract, and that is a confidentiality agreement to let them know. So even though the presumption at law is it's confidential, whether I tell them or not, I still tell them and have them sign something that it is confidential. So yes, so anyone coming into that room as this, let's call it relative support person, let's call it a support person. Uh, anyone who comes in, he or she doesn't get in until they sign confidentiality. Once they do that, with the permission of the other side, hey, they're in, no problem. And my job is to manage them, make sure they don't take over the situation, that don't get the fire questions. And just give me a paint a, a brief picture of this. In a mediation, each side doesn't fire questions across at each other as if they're in a deposition. It is nothing even remotely like a deposition. It's a it's a negotiation. One party speaks at a time, regulated by me. So no one's in it. So you could have 22 people on one side and one person on the other, it's still balanced because only one person is going to speak at a time and it's regulated by the mediator. Have you ever had people come back and call your office and say, John, I really want to renegotiate our settlement or our arrangement with our kids. I know that you've completed our arrangement, but I need to redo this. And it has happened legitimately. And again, 
Uh, either you're being intuitive or you've had experiences not in your own life, but you've seen divorce before. It's intuitive. I mean, I'm just kind that, of... that's, that's what I'm sensing from you. These are intuitive questions. If you would, rephrase that question, and I'll be able to give you a better answer. Sure. In other words, has one party come back to you after their divorce was mediated, successfully mediated, and said, I have a new situation in my life. I need to renegotiate the terms of child visitation. And I, I, I have a handle on that now. Okay. The answer is yes. Legitimately, it's called at law a change of circumstances. For example, if I'll use myself as an example. If I was divorced and I was, say, the payor of support, I was paying support. Well, if I lose my job, that's a change of circumstances. If I get ill, gravely ill, someone has a, a fatality. So there's always legitimate change of circumstances where someone needs to re- revisit their agreement. Otherwise, they can't build, they're going to be in breach. They think, oh, there are some folks, too, who will say, well, I'm, I've remarried. I've done this. So as long as it's legitimate, there's always recourse. It's for those folks who are uh, uh, trying to modify uh, anything that would be to the other person's detriment. But if it's a legitimate, that's where they're going to have a problem. But if it's a legitimate change of circumstances, uh, they always have recourse. And what I encourage people is to come back into mediation if something changes, rather than going to litigation. If it worked once, it'll work again. So the answer is yes, it happens, but legitimately it happens. What about the other states that are like California? There are nine community property states throughout the U.S. I'll never be able to rattle them off. I wish you would rattle some off. Uh, Arizona is one, uh, for sure. Uh, I think uh, Nevada. And and beyond that, though, I'd be uh, truly reaching and guessing. But there's there's nine states uh, that are community property, which means the rest of what's called the other 41, equitable distribution states. It's a simple... I can uh, define this if you'd like me to. Please. In community property... It's uh, the assumption that law is that anything acquired during the marriage is community property. So at the dissolution of that marriage, it's divided 50-50 in very broad strokes. And equitable, which means it's also no fault. Let me go further. It's community property slash no fault. It doesn't matter what the reason is. Someone could be uh, uh, cheating on their husband and wife. Someone could be doing all sorts of things, you know, drugs or alcohol. And the, and the state, in essence, doesn't care in a no fault state. So it's going to be a 50-50 deal to dissolution, uh, no matter what the cause was. Whereas an equitable uh, equitable distribution, let me say that straight, Um, (laughs) there is a a degree to show you the slight difference. If someone had cheated on somebody else, as the ultimate example, there's a chance in an equitable distribution state that that will come into play, that the reason for the divorce might be considered in those states, but even there, the worst case or best case scenario, depending what side of the fence you're on, is you could forfeit two thirds of your properties acquired or assets acquired during the marriage if you're the one causing the divorce. That's the only subtle difference. And in community property, it's straight 50 50, no matter what the cost. So, in that scenario, it's already really built in systemically for litigation. Uh, depending if you're talking about equitable dist- distribution of community property, in equitable distribution, there's there's always that argument can be made. Well, let's go after the person who wants the divorce. Remember, as you actually opened up this conversation, right, you could legitimately seek a divorce. You just, you fell out of love. I mean, there's no angst, anxiety, cheating. It's just, I, you know, I'm, I'm no longer in this relationship mentally or emotionally. So you, you can do that. Um, but in equitable distribution states, someone could say, let's just go after them anyway, you know, and see if we can win another third more. Whereas in uh, community property, that's why I tell folks, you don't exactly need legal representation. The reason is it's going to end up where it ends up anyway. The only time people, and I've, I've met them, I've met people who spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on their divorce and got nowhere. If, if there's that kind of uh, activity going on, one, they have assets, two, there's legal wrangling going on. And, and that's what, either someone's trying to hide something or the legal wrangling is what pads the bill. Because in California, it ends up where it ends up. It, it either is a community property asset or it's not. If it is, it's divided 50-50. The only discussions about that is if you start negotiating, you take this asset, I'll take that asset, rather than divide the actual asset. That's probably a longer answer than you expected. <laughs> no, no, no. I hear you. I hear you. What about people's concerns about the transfer of assets once mediation starts? And that's actually much of what we handle. Certainly people with children... Children are paramount, even with us. But beyond that, it's uh, finances and property. Um, from the beginning of the process, we start to identify 
what is an asset or what is a debt, and then once we the, enough of the process has gone by, usually the first session, and their heads are in the game where now it's problem solving rather than fighting or debating. Um, they will start to problem solve what we're going to do, and then it's up to them to execute. So anyone coming through mediation is going to execute all these things, but even in litigation. It's not the attorneys who go and close your credit card accounts. It's you. So we just like anything else, what's at risk here? What do we, what's remaining open? What's going to get liquidated one at a time? And then we figure out who does it and when, and we start putting terms to those. Things. And what about bank accounts? Oh, everything. Whatever someone has, anything that's even a remote asset or a debt, uh, inheritance or otherwise, uh, we, we handle it. Does inheritance become transferred to the other party? No, no. There's two. In the community, it's a good question. Um, in a community property state, there's still two, at least in California, there's still two ways you can acquire separate property in a community property state. And you just identified one of them uh, is inheritance. So an inheritance uh, at law will be presumed to be someone's separate property. So right now, using myself as an example, if I inherited $100,000, got divorced the next day, that, that money's mine. Got it. The, other, the other way you can acquire community property, uh, a separate property in a community property state, is through gift. So if someone said to me, John, here's, this gift is to you. I know you're married to your wife, Debbie, but this gift is to you specifically. That would be my separate property as well. That's interesting. Other than that, the assumption at law is it's a, a community property unless they can prove that they had it or acquired it before the marriage. Why divorce mediation under $5,000? And that was my uh, personal set point. And the reason why I can do that, I know this is self-serving, but that is very inexpensive. If anybody knows anything about divorce, that's very inexpensive. So I'm going to answer the, the price set point and why I do the uh, flat fee. The price set point is, is based on my experience. I know that over a year's time as a businessman, based on my methodology, my copyrighted methodology and my skill set, that I'm going to average two four-hour sessions 99% of the time. Well, when I know that, I now know my, it, with, it virtually becomes a fixed cost for me. It's not, it's still very, but it becomes a fixed cost. So I know in a year's time, I'm still in the black. So that's one reason why I do a uh, flat fee. Another reason is people know that they're not going to spend five cents more than that. Whether you're an attorney or a mediator, anyone who bills out by the hour, some people have to bill out by the hour. But if I was to bill out by the hour, in any lawsuit, and always remember, divorce is a lawsuit. You can just mediate it in, in a civil fashion. Um, any any lawsuit, it, it, anyone billing by the hour, strike like that. Anyone billing by the hour, they there's an infinite, virtually in theory, an infinite number of billable hours in a lawsuit because anything can come up. Well, when I propose a flat fee to folks, they know that whether it takes me eight hours or a hundred and eight hours, they're not spending five cents more. They come in knowing that they're not going to spend it anymore, uh, and I know what my job is, and everybody, it, people tend to like that. But the, the flat fee is more, oh, it's almost more of a marketing thing for me as much as I can, I can do it. I can effectually uh, get this done in eight hours, including the paperwork with my paralegal, and uh, move forward. Uh, within that, I used to, I think I mentioned to you, have an office in Newport Beach. I had all the bells and whistles. Um, I, I now have closed that bricks and mortar uh, location, and, I, and that's another way I can pass savings on to folks. So the reason why I can keep it below $5,000 is I, I have cut my overhead to the bare minimum, and I pass those savings along as well. I think that's fantastic. Do you think that it's realistic to vision that the entertainment industry, people who are in trouble, would utilize you? We, we could only hope. Uh, you know, in, in today's uh, world, but with any big-time dispute, let me say it this way. My answer is yes, as self-serving as that is, anything, and this is a true statement, anything that can be civilly litigated or arbitrated can be mediated. So the answer to your question, if it's a civil lawsuit that they're about to enter into, whether it goes to litigation or not, can it be mediated? The answer is yes. Will it be mediated is up to the parties. If they're into the mode of, I'm just seeking revenge and I'm going to pay you back in public, in a public way, well, it'll never be mediated. But if they actually have a beef that they say, I'd rather, I'd rather resolve this and fight about it, it can be mediated, absolutely. And those high-profile cases would come in handy for any small business person, but there are, I'm sure they're few and far between.
I know that this is what you specialize in, so we're talking about that. But I just wondered, you know, all of these divorces, you could have been there. Oh, oh, this. In um, I guarantee, I don't care how many attorneys they had, how pow- how high power they were. Ultimately, they settle. Uh, know this that statistically, the way it's stated is this: ninety nine percent of all civil lawsuits settle. They never get a rendering or a verdict from a judge or a jury. It includes divorce. Most of them settle. So since it's going to settle, so there's a 99% chance your case is going to settle, my advice is start in the settlement process. Just, just start right there virtually in the middle and just work closer together since it's going to settle anyway. Don't you think that why people don't, A, have the mindset to begin in a settlement process is that mediation is still very much kind of like a resonant program in the computer. It's somewhere in there, but it's not in your awareness. I completely agree. As I, I think I mentioned earlier, by, uh, when I had a company, 14 business partners, 15 business partners, there was a bunch of us, um, all that money went to uh, marketing and advertising. If, if people knew, let me say, if people knew what we did, as you alluded to before, and what we can do at the price we do it for, they should be beating down my door. Clearly. And the thing is that I really think that most people's mindset or many people's mindset, A, doesn't have the information and doesn't know that this is legitimate in terms of settling these kind of disputes, but also creating a game plan for what's next inside the settlement for divorces. But also, it's very interesting with the Charlie Sheen thing going on. That's an example this is really not about him, but it's about what's being expressed. This whole thing about winning and losing. Yeah. And when there's a dispute, what kicks into high gear is at any cost. I've got to win. I'm going to win. This is about winning and losing. It's ingrained in us in yeah. our Western culture society. It's so deep level. And I'm wondering in your experience and in your practice over many years, is it obvious to you that that's what takes over when you first begin mediation? I would say 90% of the time, that's what I see. One or both parties are in those uh, in, in immutable positions. They're going to be intractable. I, I, I'm, I'm coming after you. So not only do I think I'm right, now I'm going to punish you and prove it to you. So many people come in with that uh, uh, mindset, but that goes along with, and this is a personal opinion, but I see it all the time, there's what I believe is a culture of incivility in the United States. It's been brewing for a long, long time. Part of that culture of incivility is uh, a lack of respect for womanhood. And I, I don't know when it happened, 56 years old, I don't know when it happened when men began to disrespect uh, women and ladies and stop being gentlemanly, but it's part of the culture that incivility. So most people, not like that, many people come into a mediation or a litigation uh, with a lot of anger and hostility, not all. But, but some doing it, and certainly that's much of what fuels a lawsuit, and that's much of what I dissipate in the you know, first few hours of uh, negotiating with people. But certainly, anger can fuel a lawsuit. Grief can. Uh, any strong emotion can fuel a lawsuit. That's an interesting comment that you made, because I said to my girlfriend of a few years ago that it appears as though there is a drought of what you're referring to. Now, I called it of chivalry. <laughs> Exactly. I would agree with that. It appears as if chivalry and all that's valued in what that was understood to be is not of value anymore. I, I couldn't agree more. And I don't know exactly, because I'm not a sociologist, when and how it disappeared. But you and I agree, it's gone. It, we, we fell off that cliff where there's no boundaries. Uh, men will get in a woman's face the way he would get in another man's face these days. You know, are people still holding doors? I don't know for each other. But uh, chivalry is dead. Um, uh, a, a gross lack of respect for womanhood is gone. Elder, a lack of respect for authority. Uh, something has happened. And so it does carry over, to, to tie this into divorce, into divorce. Uh, quite frankly, I see folks, say, 40 or younger, who are part of that incivility culture. They don't even know it. They were just raised in that, that culture. Uh, they don't even know they're being uh, uncivil to each other. I have to point it out to them sometimes. That, you know, let's, let's, let's throw them back. They, they, it's a go-for-the-throat mentality. And so it's the media's job to bring them back to, that's not going to work in mediation. The thing is that as advanced and as fast as technology is developing, 
the reality is that that advancement of technology vis-a-vis cell phones and PDAs and miniaturization of being on the computer in the online universe on one level has opened up this huge opportunity for people to be able to function and operate and communicate much easier. But on another level, it's tied in youth and it's tied in this culture to everything happening now and being able to turn their attention, even sitting at dinner or you're in the middle of talking to somebody and they're taking a phone call. This is part of the incivility that's built into what you're talking about to me. Couldn't agree more. And not that it's my job to give lessons to people, but during the mediation, I'm in control. All mediators are in control of that mediation. Um, not true story. About two weeks ago, I was giving a uh, in-person consultation, people who are considering divorce and considering mediation for that divorce. So I give a free consultation. So I went to them to make it as uh, convenient as possible for them. I went to them. While I was talking to them, the wife, it just happened to be the wife, took a text message. And I actually had to address that. I thought, why am I addressing this with a 40-something-year-old woman who should know better? I said, you know, unless that's your child, I make exceptions for children. But if it's not your child, please put that down. This is important. And to her, she had no idea she was doing something wrong. Exactly. And that's why I'm saying to you, that's a perfect example And it starts with the kids today, too. We're basically empowering and giving license for all that and building that behavior in and that mindset in because they see the adults do it. I I agree, particularly with the generation that's uh, younger than myself. It it really started at that time because although I was raised by grandparents, I'm a traditionalist. um, It just makes sense, you know, to respect your elders, to respect women, to be civil, you know, don't. Have you ever drive around and you see people, they're in their cars and they're yelling and flipping people off and their kid is sitting in the front seat? You know, when did that happen? The people thought that was okay. How that ties into the divorce, they just carry that over into the divorce and their parenting. Uh, many people in a divorce, they're, they're arguing about uh, what they believe is a custody issue. And custody is really the, the schedule or the visitation. Um, what most people call custody is actually just bad parenting. And I have to define the difference for them. It's not a crime to be a bad parent. If everyone, if that was a crime, everybody would be in jail. So I have to show them the difference between what's actually uh, harmful or abusive compared to uh, bad parenting. The reason I bring it up is they go after each other on all these uh, issues. They, they, it's like take no prisoners, no quarter. And I have to define the difference for them between what is uh, uh, impolite, bad parenting, or actually uh, illegal injustice. What age can a child determine that they don't want to visit the other parent? The court will consider a kid's opinion. Don't get me wrong. They, they will consider that, but we don't call them, and now I'm speaking in my back east tone, we don't call them kids for nothing. You know, There's no way you or I, if we had, say, a 12-year-old, we're going to let a 12-year-old tell us what to do, particularly during a divorce. The court will weigh it in, but it's only one of many factors, not a high one, because, of course, you have to discern, is the kid... Uh, being uh, neglected or hurt with the other parent, and they don't know how to tell us, or do they get away with murder with that other parent, and they can't tell us. Uh, so you have to always kind of discern for that. But I don't let, my personal practice is this, to answer you directly, I do not let children into a divorce mediation. That's, that's my personal rules of mediator. I think that's smart. It, it's, you know, adults, what goes on between a married couple should stay between a married couple. What goes on between adults should stay between adults. Even relatives don't have to know. So certainly there are some things that children that should not be exposed to, but one of them is, you know, what do you think we should do in this divorce? They don't know, and I wouldn't ask them. So I, I personally, here's my, if I can give a tip, if anyone remembers anything about this interview about divorce, here's a free tip. Families need to be parent-centered families, not child-centered families. Everything emanates out from the parents. They're the caretakers. If the caretakers don't get care, no one does. So make it parent-centered, and the children revolve around you, not the other way. That's my humble opinion. I think that's very wise. Everyone, everyone, it works out well that way. As soon as you start to parentify children, you're gone. You're lost. What do you think about in the divorce situation when there's bad-mouthing going on on one side versus the other side? I have seen a lot of people take a neutral position and not bad-mouth the other parent, even though they don't like them or they're not with them anymore. Yes. Yeah. But then the other parent will badmouth and try to use the child to get information on what's happening with the ex-spouse's life. It happens, and it's ugly. And the people who do that lack, as I mentioned earlier, emotional intelligence. 
there were a lot of people. These I'm not trying to disparage folks, but I see a lot of uh, not just in civility, but part of that is because they lack emotional maturity these days. It's as if they stop maturing at 16, and I, and I see it all the time. So if someone is uh, acting out, if you will, uh, uh, they have uh, immature approaches to uh, their children, their divorce. Um, I, I can only coach. I can't overcome. So I try to coach people past uh, any uh, disabilities they have during the negotiation. I, I don't know how to best answer that question, actually. Well, I want to go back to that other question, which is in a state like California, I had heard that if a child turns a certain age and doesn't want to see the other parent, that the courts will listen to that. Again, listen, but not base their decision on that. Okay. It so, depends on the kid's motive and why the other parent or one of them is trotting that kid out. As an example, this is an off example, but to make my point, in the 1980s, the allegation of child abuse during divorce went up by 85%. The allegation went up by 85% during a divorce. It was only proven in court 35% of the time. Just using that statistic, it, you, you could, you, it could be interpreted a couple of different ways. Uh, either they could miss uh, you know, uh, a large percentage of abuse, or it's used as a, as a just a simply way as a tool to beat somebody up, as if you would use your know, fist or an ugly word. It's it can be very very uh, dangerous, and I have to guard people all the time. And that's not a warning, but to guard them, if you go down that path, it better be happening. If you're using it to leverage them, I wouldn't do that because uh, the court takes those allegations, child, child abuse, child, you know, the kid's opinion, if they hear anything about the child welfare being uh, neglected, that's when the court really ramps things up. So I try to guard people against, are you, is it just a bad parenting issue or is your kid actually harmed? Very interesting. Now, do you do mediation in anything other than divorce? I know that you specialize in divorce, but would you? Yes. In fact, I have, I do, and I, and I, I will. I have a case coming up. I, I can't say specifically about the... Uh, Two employees uh, in the, actually, I, I shouldn't even approach that, but I have two employees. I do employee mediation, but for the past several years, about the past 10 years, it's not uh, line employees, it's managers. I, I'm brought in because this is a dispute between managers who, using my words, are, are keepers. They, they, they respect both these managers. They're both A-plus on paper, but there's an issue growing in the work, and it's, it's causing a, a dissension in the workplace. So uh, next week, I'll be doing a case between two managers here in Orange County. Uh, so I do employment ones, and much of that's based on my uh, background as a union executive board officer. Really? What other types of mediation do you do? If you were to look at my uh, bio, you would say, well, he does employment and he does divorce. Those, those are a given. But when you can mediate, it, it sounds like an exaggeration. You can mediate almost anything. Now, of course, the clients, and you, you need to have some expectation of knowledge about that. But you don't need to know everything about everything. So I could actually mediate, uh, you know, homeowner association disputes, real estate disputes, which is what I've done, uh, neighbor disputes. Um, I haven't done any uh, complex litigation yet, but complex litigation is actually taken into mediation too. So I guess my two specialties that I could say that people would say, yeah, John, you're being uh, straight with us. It's employment and um, the domestic. But I've also been qualified to provide units in mediation, continuing education units in mediation to the Department of Real Estate, the Department of Nursing. So I can do disputes within that. Uh, I, I hate to say it, it's everything, but when you can mediate, the only thing you don't know is um, what you're applying it to. Got For it. Example, when two countries are at war, and sadly there's a lot of that going on in the world, well, there's no one person who knows everything about those countries. They just know how to mediate. How do you, as a mediator, get people to agree to mediate? That's actually the first hurdle. So when my phone rings, that person is either curious about mediation or has done some homework and they've made up their mind that mediation is the way to go. So the caller is typically convinced about mediation. My job is to convince them about me. The next hurdle is the other spouse. So you begin to have conversations on the phone with the first caller saying, does he or she know you're filing for divorce? Does he or she know you're seeking out mediators? And uh, oftentimes what you discover is one spouse simply relinquishes the responsibility to do any of the heavy lifting. So someone has to go out there and make calls, you know, research prices of mediators and all this. Um, but even with that, if, they, if the other person finds a mediator, he or she typically just says, okay, you found them, I'll go. Very rarely does someone find the mediator, and 
and the other person just summarily dismisses them because they probably figure, well, if you found them, he or she must agree with you, so they're already sided with you. That happens very rarely. Most of the time, it's as I explained. Someone has to call. They're already convinced. It's just getting the other person on board with the fact that they're going to get divorced. Mediation is the best way to go, and if I'm that guy. How long does it usually take you to be on the phone with the other person where they have come on board? What is your experience? Just an initial consultation. I haven't met with them yet and all this. I would say between uh, 30 to 60 minutes. Because the more they, when people start, um, actually what I'm hearing from them is oftentimes raw conversation, that stream of consciousness, because information uh, just generates more questions. So it can evolve in the, in the 30 to 60 minutes. But for my free consultations, which are always free, um, it, it doesn't matter to me. I always tell folks, it's part of my business model. They couldn't call me too much or email me too much, even though I'm not on the clock. One of the reasons is, as you nailed, there's a lot of misconceptions about divorce. They're getting a lot of bad advice. So I'd rather them do that with me. Plus, the more time I have with them, the more I can make them comfortable with who I am and my style as a mediator. Do people come back to you and say thank you? Do people come back to you years later? What has been your experience of the gratitude level? That's a two-part question, believe it or not. The gratitude level, not just for me, but for any media who achieves a, a successful agreement, people want to carry you out on their shoulders. I'm not exaggerating because think of, we use divorce, which is usually the ultimate example of hostilities, angst, what's involved, you know, life-critical issues. They come in oftentimes, I'll bet at least 50% or more of the people come in thinking this is impossible. No mediator could uh, overcome this. So it could surmount the issues we have. I hear that a lot. And then they realize that over time, within eight hours, it happens to you. So although people will come in with um, healthy skepticism, I am able to, uh, you know, in those consultations, uh, address their concerns and fears, diminish that, and get them to the table. So it, that's not exactly, getting them into mediation isn't exactly the hard part once they know they're getting divorced and they want to save money. It's actually being in there in the moment where they're sitting across from each other, and that, that's where the magic happens. That's where the media's work is done. Have you ever done mediation where people are out of state? Again, once again, very intuitive question. I haven't done out of state, but I have done not in person. Technically, if you're face-to-face, that would be a mediation. Uh, here's how I define the difference. If you're not face-to-face, physically face-to-face, for whatever reason, that's a conciliation. It's the same difference, but that's how I define it. Conciliation means you're not face-to-face. Mediation is your face-to-face. So I've had to do it where, for whatever reason, business, moving, or otherwise, people have been unable to be physically present to do a mediation. I've had that rare occasion. But my practice is, my methodology that I I actually uh, promote and teach is to have them at that table, eyeball to eyeball. That's where the magic really is. What about if one of the parties is moving out of state there's children involved, and it's very complex. I've done that. I, I can answer that question. Now, I'm going to define uh, complex. Complex, it's, it's never so complex that it can't be figured out. It just feels complex. But if you take it, and much of what I do is dissect problems so you can attack the problem you know, and, and start resolving it. But I've done uh, more than my fair share of people who mostly for financial reasons have had to leave the state as a divorce. It's obscenely expensive to live in California. It, it That's just, true. So sometimes, because their incomes are reduced, they have to move uh, Midwest or wherever, or back with families somewhere. All of, the only thing complex would be the visitation, and, and even that's not hard. It's more the uh, the logistics of it. Because if you're out of state, you have young children, uh, and both parents want to see their kids live out of state. It simply means we have to figure this out. It, in broad strokes, almost invariably, it has to be where wherever the kids go in the school. That's that's the primary residence, and the other person sees uh, the children when they're not in school, in broad strokes. But it's everything has, take it to the bank, everything has an answer. In fact, if I can take a second to embellish on that, I think people find this interesting. When people come to me for divorce as a mediator, no matter how insurmountable they think it is, here's a guarantee, Kim. I guarantee there's at minimum one answer in the universe. At least one. And how do I know that as a mediator? Because if they go to court and they leave it up to a judge, that judge is going to render a decision. There's no one who goes before a judge for any reason, divorce or otherwise, where the judge goes, you know what? You stumped me. 
I can't figure this out. That never happens. So since we know a judge is going to figure it out, the media is simply his or her job is to draw the people, not push them. Litigation pushes people to the answer. Mediation pulls people to the answer where since we know there's a minimum of one answer in the universe, you come to that decision. Sounds very much like rainmaking. It's, it's, it's probably analogous to that. And the reason is it's perfect. It's ideal. If there's such a thing as a panacea for conflict, mediation and negotiation is as close as you can come. For the United States and the Western culture, mediation is that panacea as much as one can be for con- any, any conflict. How come it is that when people first come in to mediation, even though, let's say, one person initiated it and the person that they're not going to be with anymore has agreed, mm-hmm. it still doesn't mean they come in visioning the resolution or really seeing the possibility. And sometimes when they begin, they don't see that possibility of a resolution you must be doing something that's equivalent to magic. At what point do you usually see couples that are dissolving their association begin to have the lights on that something is in the works? Sure. Again, intuitive question. Me, I use an extreme to make a point. I compare it to uh, borrowing from uh, Kubla Ross, the death and dying, the series, the, the, the sequence, the steps of grieving. I've had people who come into a divorce, to answer your question, Someone is already at the acceptance stage. They're mentally and emotionally already divorced. They just are. And in fact, might even be in a relationship already. The other person is at the earlier stages, maybe depression, maybe anger. Within those eight hours, to answer your question, I can, I, I can see and sense when I have been able to draw that person who's in denial or depression and move them toward acceptance, at least to the point where this divorce is happening. Them. So when someone comes in uh, either begrudgingly dragging their feet or they're in denial, that's part of my job is to bring them forward. And here's a quick answer, uh, a statement I make that will make my point. I tell them, and this is always true, in California, since it's community property, no fault state, a divorce can happen to you or a divorce can happen with you. Because in California, it only takes one spouse to get a divorce. You don't need two people to get a divorce. It just takes one. The other person can make it challenging and drag their feet, but they can't stop it. So when I tell them it can happen with you or to you, let it happen with you and let me help you, that gives you a sense of what I'm always doing in there to bring them forward for their sake. It's inspiring their own dominion. Well said. Let's talk about another kind of invisible thing that's going on, at least subconsciously, with people that are dissolving their association, which is the issue of saving face. That happens, too. That's in there, in the texture. Yes. Do you find that on some level your facilitation helps save face if there's a lot of hurt? Once again, and I'm, I'm not just blowing smoke at you. You're exactly right. You've done your homework. or you, you, Your intuition's working perfectly. Restate that question one more time. I'll give you a direct answer. Right now. Okay. There's going to be times where... One of the two people has gotten hurt or offended or insulted or something has gone public or they've been emotionally injured, spiritually injured from the other party, at least in their perception or something that's happened. And so as they enter mediation, there can be in the dynamic this need to save face. Okay. How do you deal with that? Uh, And let me uh, go directly to what I teach and what I practice. When I tell you that you're onto something here, that saving face concept, and thank you for repeating that question, that saving face uh, concept is critical in any negotiation, but particularly you know, in a divorce that's high tension there face-to-face. Where it comes up most of all for mediation is in a caucus. It's, uh, the word is caucus, C-A-U-C-U-S. All it means is a private confidential meeting between the mediator and one of the parties during the process. It's in that caucus where I can take more license or liberty because the other person can't hear or see me. I don't breach neutrality, but I can now coach or Dutch uncle somebody a little more than I can over there. And so as, as I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to them uh, about saving face, I don't, may not use those words, but I give them options or I paint a scenario that says, is this really what you want to pursue? I won't go on and on. But my job is to draw from them how does this make sense for you if you do that? I said another way, if a mediator can get someone to change their mind while saving face for their sake, they owe you 10 times what they're paying you. Exactly. That's how important it is. And so I'm always there 
saving face with the other person, uh, either right before their very eyes in front of people or in a caucus. It, it really is critical. And it's that people have no idea you're doing that for them. They have no right. idea. Right. That's why I'm bringing it up, because it's in the texture. It's subtle. It's being done in a way that it's being taken care of. Let me ask you a rhetorical question. But I'm going to ask for your response. If you would like that, you would, uh, if you were in, the, in divorce mediation, you would welcome that if you saw it, where I allowed you to change your mind to save faith. You, you would be grateful for that privilege. And so uh, knowing that, and when I do that for folks, they don't go, okay, John taught me a lesson. It's good. John's gave me a saving face way out of this. I still get what I need. Uh, without taking that that hit, so I'm always every media is one doing that, and you're always the person taking the brunt of it. You're the whipping post. I rather have them beat up on me or be angry at me, not that they are, uh, rather than um, each other. And so if I can get them to change their mind while saving face, I honestly believe they owe me at least ten times what they're already paying. And the last question is before we <laughs> before we complete the first segment together of 2011, which is. To what extent does the experience of equitability come to play in the concerns of the people that are getting the divorce mediation? And how does it come to play at the end point? It's always hypercritical in the early stages. In the early stages, hypercritical, that equitability factor. Um, let me give you a statement that I teach mediators to use. In mediation, what is fair? is not always equitable, allow me to explain. If you and I were getting divorced, Kim, there to make it easy for me, and there was a house that we both lived in, but it takes some time to sell. If, if the answer is we're going to sell the house or buy each other, it takes some time to remove that property, uh, to sell that property. And I say to you, okay, Kim, you stay there with the kids. I'll go live in the back of the Chevy. If someone just came to our planet and looked at that negotiated settlement there for this temporary one, you would say, it's unfair. It's not equal. Now, it's not equal, but it's fair to them. They chose to do that. So the answer is, in mediation, what is fair is not only equal, but in the early stages, they're going penny for penny, dollar for dollar. No one's backing down. It's only eight hours later where they see there's a give and take and they've dis I've dissipated their negative energy that there's room for negotiation. So it's very it's, – sometimes people go 50-50 because they're so angry. It's, it's straight down the middle. Then some people go, okay, I get it. I get it. A few bucks here, a few bucks there in a lifetime aren't going to kill me. So most people are very malleable, if you will, in a mediation. But some equity is their only position. Equitability is their only position. So it better be 50-50 all the way, including the debt. You talked about a distinction between fairness and equitability. I still want you to tease it out because sure. I'm having trouble with your distinction. Yeah, and let me see if I can embellish that a little further. If you and I own property or anything, in a community property state, it says 50-50, right? It's, right. However, there may be... Uh, a reason why I relinquish my actual 50%. Either I got something for it or it's for the kids' sake. Uh, you know, one of us has to live in that house. We can't both be there. It's just easier for me as a male to do it. And so I relinquish my 50% right to live in that house until this divorce is final, the house is sold. It's for the kids' sake, for peace, to reign, for whatever reason. For whatever reason. Now, Maybe I'm misusing the word equitability, but I'm thinking, you know, 50, as near 50-50 as possible is what I think you mean. There were some times where people will voluntarily relinquish 50%. I get that part. So in that scenario, it's not that it's fair, it's that it's what works for the scenario. Is that what you're saying? Yes. I, that well said. It's what's fair for the scenario and what they think is best. Someone else might it, to go... I know it sounds like I'm beating the horse. Somebody else might have made a different decision in that scenario, but they made that decision in that scenario, so it's fair and equitable to them. It doesn't have to be 50-50 to be fair. Okay, that's what I wanted to hear. That's what I wanted to get. I wanted that clear. Okay. And what happens when one part of the team wants to go mediation and they can't get the soon-to-be ex-spouse to go into mediation? There's a, then there's a step process. I tell them the best bet is for them to forward my phone number and, and website and all those things. But if ultimately they can't get them to call me, I will call that other person. I really am hesitant to do that because they haven't called me. It means they think I'm going to try to sell them on this. But I'll try to call them. Most likely, if someone is dragging their feet because they don't – there are some people on a divorce who don't want to divorce. One of them flat out doesn't want to divorce and isn't going to do anything to uh, participate. I'll give you the uh, snap answer and see if this helps. There's ultimately something in California called a default divorce, and that is if one spouse either can't be found, refuses to participate every step of the way, that person 
will the other person will win by default, ergo default divorce. But that takes about you know weeks and weeks, weeks and months and months and months to do that. Um, if anyone doesn't come to the process, the uh, mediation, it, then uh, that's when I say it's going to happen to them. And so long before they end up in a default divorce, that other person will come across. But it's sometimes very rare. Very rare. It takes that kind of uh, encouragement to get people into the mediation process. Let's say that one person wants a divorce, but they're still sold on going through an attorney. Okay. And let's say they've retained legal counsel. Okay. So and the person who called me has an attorney. Yeah. But they're calling me to test the waters of mediation. Yes. Okay. So what I would be uh, talking to them about is, uh, now, one, if they have an attorney, I'm supposed to be dealing with them. That's my disclaimer. If they have an attorney, I should be dealing with them. But let's say I'm talking to that person now and with their attorney's permission. The attorney says, yeah, go find a mediator. I would let them know that either one, they can represent themselves, and the safety net they have is don't sign an agreement until you have your attorney review it. That's one of the safety nets of mediation. So before they sign the agreement, they can have it reviewed or... You can bring your attorney into the mediation with you. Why would an attorney promote or empower mediation? That is not what they're about. You're exactly right. I'm not disparaging them as a, a group. Uh, they're not a monolithic group moving in unison. However, I'm just being practical. This is an opportunity for them to have a client and do their thing with divorce. So, so why would the motiv- they okay? What's the motivation for a family law attorney to refer to mediation? The answer, no motivation. They have no motivation. They're talking themselves out of money. But what they would, can do, though, is every once in a while, I'm not saying they're unethical. I'm saying that's what they know is, is the battle. So why would a family law attorney refer someone to mediation when they may just disrespect mediation? However, I do work with some family law attorneys who respect mediation very much. In fact, I met them through a mediation process. I was meeting their client. Uh, so the ones who are mediation friendly, they get it. If the other side is uh, non-adversarial but just wants legal representation, great. With an attorney in their calling, I can tell them, you can either come on your own. Here's the short answer. <laughs> After this long one. You can come on your own, have him or her with you in there, or go into litigation. But litigation is the most expensive. Huh? What about a spouse who... I think I know where you're going with this. I call these actually uh, sales objections. So now I'm on the phone. i give you a visual. I'm on the phone talking to these people. Um, all I'm really doing is overcoming sales objections from my perspective. However, it's a legitimate question. The other side goes, John, why would I ever come into mediation when he or she has an attorney? I'll be outgunned. I'll be outmanned. So my job now is to convince them how and why that won't happen in the mediation. I'm there. It's not a deposition. The attorney does not get to ask you questions and fire and demand answers. And I'm going to try to make them as comfortable as possible why and how it still benefits them. Ultimately, it benefits them if the other person with an attorney says, I'm only coming into mediation, as we discussed earlier, if my attorney can be with me, I'm really going to sell this other person on coming in. Otherwise, they're going straight to litigation. I totally get it. I would imagine you don't have to sell it because most people know how expensive litigation is and how it costs families so much money. It's unbelievable, the cost, beyond, as you mentioned, beyond money, the cost uh, beyond money. Uh, so it's, it's, you should avoid litigation at all. I, I think even an attorney would tell you that. You should avoid litigation at all costs. So why aren't more family law attorneys actually rolling up their sleeves and also becoming great mediators? It's my direct and completely candid answer. They don't make enough money in mediation. Think about it. What I do for $4,850, complete divorce, including paperwork, they, that's, a, that's a, a retainer for an attorney. I'm completing the job. That's their, that's their opening retainer. So it's flat out they don't make enough money because they, there's not enough billable hours in there. I, I hate to say it that way. That's practical. But it would really solve a lot of the family divorce problems before, during, and after. Not only resolved it, I've already proven it many times. I have I don't know how many hundreds of cases I've done that mediation works. I'll go further. This is going to sound grandiose, but I think you, Kim, will accept this. And that is mediation has the potential to change cultural and social mores as we know them regarding conflict. I agree with you. That's how grand mediation can be. We have to get away from this in- culture of instability, which is getting worse. So it's not going to go away. And it's an impediment to mediation taking off, this, this, this of incivility. Because people go right from zero to 60 in one second, right for your juggler. Uh, but mediation has that potential to change cultural and social mores. Now, let's bring it down to a more practical scale. 
you're getting a divorce. If you don't, don't have children, you'll never see each other again. End of story. But if you have children, you are joined together at the hip for the rest of your lives. It's unavoidable. But only in mediation with the post-divorce relationship has any hope. It's only in mediation where you resolve things non-adversarially, you are called to communicate through a mediator, and you reach an agreement mutually, voluntarily with each other. Uh, it's then and only then does the post-divorce relationship have any hope. In litigation, you might as well just torch that ground and walk away. Who are your heroes in mediation and in conflict resolution? Uh, you know, it's, a, it's a legitimate question. Um, I, I, there's no one I look up to. I hate to say that. Uh, there's no one who really moves me or inspires me in uh, mediation. I, I, I saw it. I saw the light many years ago. I actually believe, and I know I sound grandiose, that I've done more forging in the field to promote the professional uh, level of mediation and the uh, depth and breadth of mediation than anyone I personally know, even above organizations. Think about it. Unbeknownst to you, there are, organ- there are organizations of mediators. One is called, I-, I won't name them, but there's organizations of mediators. You haven't heard anything from them. You haven't seen legislation from them. They don't lobby. There's no advertising. So I think I've done more to promote this system. So I'm my own lead. In, in, as grandiose as that sounds, that's my candid opinion. And how do people learn from you? Is it through UCLA Extension? Do you train people to become mediators? Yes, that's what so I have two streams of revenue. One is training, one is doing actual cases. And the training, my primary training is uh, how to create mediators. California has a minimum standard of 25 hours of training to be a mediator. That's the minimum standard. And so that, that minimum standard, that classroom experience, is what I teach and have taught through UCLA Extension for about 15 years now. So I, I trained, believe it or not, judges come to me, attorneys come to me. It, historically, at UCLA, it's always true, about 33% of all my classes are attorneys and judges because they're going to try to make a transition. When's your next class? The next class isn't scheduled yet. What's happened is this. Um, all, extent, all training and extension courses in, in every university are down. The economy is killing them. And in fact, uh, UCLA Extension, just to give you, a, it's an interesting story, um, Prior to this economy, UCLA Extension for all these years has been the number one provider of extended education to postgraduate professionals ever. But anyone else is a distant second. NYU was the, the next close competitor, but they were so far the second is scary. Even UCLA Extension has had to cut back their um, extension classes. So right now, my class and many classes are on hold until enrollments go back up. So there's nothing scheduled at this time. Are they the only ones that certify mediators? No, I'm the only person they use there. Are there other locations to receive training on how to become a mediator? Yeah, sure. What I'm saying is, does becoming a mediator require certification? I'm going to give you a yes, no answer. It's mostly yes. If you want to do it legitimately, you want to do it for a court, you want to do it for somebody, they're going to see what your credential is, and it starts with the minimum basic training. Right now, because mediation is not yet regulated by the state as a profession, it re- they don't re- regulate the people, they regulate some of the uh, methods we use. I'll explain that in a minute. But the uh, state does not now regulate us. There's no certificate. There's no license. So everything is a self-certification. Said in another way, Kim, you could right now put in your business card mediator at large and not be illegal. You would be unethical, but you would not be illegal. So the answer is anyone can call themselves a mediator, but if you want to go according to the existing standard, the adopted standard, it's tr- it starts with a 25-hour training. So why can't you do a 25-hour training? Why does it have to be through UCLA? If you're asking me, I, I teach this independently. Uh, I used to teach it very regularly uh, to corporations, because remember, conflict is everywhere. So uh, I, I can certify them as mediators. It's just what they're applying it to, as I mentioned a long time ago, what they're going to use it for. But I used to do, I do corporate training all the time. It's just these days, um, training is the first to go. When, when things get lean in companies, Training is the first thing to go. I would imagine this would be one of the first important trainings that everybody in business should have, which is conflict resolution. You and I agree. Conflict resolution is up there, and equal to that, is, as I mentioned earlier, is emotional intelligence. It's Indeed. called EI. It's, you put those together, now you've got something. Now you have something. Above all else, even above those two, if I was talking to an employer, I would say emotional intelligence. If you're certified in California as a mediator... Right. Can you mediate something in Florida or in one of those states? It's yes, no. The yes part is yes, because no state, no state in the United States yet 
regulates the profession of mediation. Nobody. However, if you mediate for their courts, they expect some minimum standards. But those court cases, those are all volunteers. Anyone who mediates for the court, in essence, everybody who mediates for the court, is a mediator is a volunteer. The court does not assign... Check that. The court always assigns cases to mediation in California uh, for civil matters, but uh, those medias are not being paid. Otherwise, it's like the judge ordering you to pay somebody. That's important. But the question really is, if somebody is in another state and it's not court-ordered mediation... Right. Anybody can mediate it. That's my answer. You could mediate a problem between a couple in another state as long as that state is... Since they're coming in voluntarily... It doesn't matter. Anybody right. can mediate anywhere. So there's no state certificate. So does the 25-hour certificate mean anything to anybody in Florida? It means nothing. Would you have it or not? It's just can you mediate? Got it. Answer, yeah. It's only if you start doing some civil cases for the court that they have to have some minimum standard of training. So really, there's enough conflict to last many lifetimes. It's unbelievable, and it's just getting worse. <laughs> It's a great pleasure to have you on the show. You've shared so much with our audience. John Biancardi, you're a jewel, and I hope that you will come back again. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been talking to John Biancardi, the founder of Divorce Mediation Associates. I think after listening to this interview, you know that he's more qualified than most people in the world to provide affordable mediation. You can reach him by going to www.d ma-divorce.com. Thanks so much, John. Thank you, Kim. And thank you for the audience. too. My pleasure.